Coming up, the author of The End of Alzheimer's, Dr. Dale Bredesen shares how to prevent and reverse the effects of the deadly disease. And then, he's a senior pastor and Fox News contributor. Dr. Robert Jeffress joins us live on today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Just days after Hurricane Harvey drenched Texas, one of the most tragic events, a Category 5, Category 5 hurricane named Irma is threatening Florida and the Caribbean islands with sustained winds of 185 miles an hour. They say it is potentially catastrophic it is considered the worst storm that ever came out of the Atlantic toward the United States. And who knows what's going to happen to Florida. If it, it goes across Florida, it could be devastating. If it jumps back into the Gulf, which some people are thinking, I just cannot conceive of, of what could be happening. But uh, they say it may hit the Carolinas. We don't know for sure. But it's one of those things that people had really better do some praying because this thing is a monster. Wendy. That's so true, Pat. Forecasters are watching Irma closely as it seems virtually certain to hit the U.S. by early next week. Amber Strong has the latest. Florida residents aren't leaving anything to chance, stocking up on water and supplies and taking the necessary steps to get ready for the extremely high winds expected if Hurricane Irma makes its way ashore there. President Trump has already approved emergency declarations for both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands for what forecasters are predicting could be the most powerful storm in the history of the Atlantic. The airports on the island of Antigua have shut down with a simple prayer, may God protect us all. And in Florida, Governor Rick Scott has issued a state of emergency for all 67 counties. Do not sit and wait to prepare. Get prepared now. Officials in the Florida Keys have also ordered mandatory evacuations. It's going to be crazy getting out of here. It's going to be gridlocked. Getting out of the Keys, there's only one way in and one way out. Water, batteries, flashlights, the essentials. I think right now it's a little bit too early to tell, but it's a good time to be prepared. All this comes as Texans are still cleaning up in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers are working to tie emergency funding for disaster aid after Harvey to efforts to raise the debt ceiling. A vote could come as early as today. In the meantime, charities like CBN's Operation Blessing are standing in the gap, with thousands of volunteers helping with the cleanup efforts and working alongside Texans hoping to restore their lives. The incredible thing is, is when Operation Blessing volunteers arrive, they go from being incredibly downcast to all of a sudden having hope, all of a sudden knowing that they're not alone. The OB team says they will continue their work with Texans and are also getting ready for Hurricane Irma as well. We're praying that that thing somehow turns around and goes out to sea, but if it hits the U.S., Operation Blessing will be there. We'll be in more communities just like we were in the eight cities here in Texas, loving on people, working with local pastors and churches and emergency management. <sighs> Experts are warning wind speeds could reach up to 225 miles per hour before all is said and done. So they're warning people in the way of the storm to take it seriously. Amber Strong, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Amber. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I remember I was down in Florida. I came down after a, a hurricane no, known as Andrew hit down there. It had tornado winds inside of the hurricane, 210 miles an hour. The devastation was beyond belief. Whole neighborhoods in southern Florida wiped out. I mean, it was just extraordinary. And this thing has the potential. If it goes across Florida, jumps into the Gulf, I just, uh, my heart breaks for people in New Orleans and people in Texas uh, that would be under the, the gun of that horrible thing. So please pray. And let me tell you, Operation Blessing is going to be there helping. Um, so we, we, we believe in helping uh, what's happening, neighbors helping neighbors, volunteers. Operation Blessing probably is the best organized for uh, mobilizing uh, volunteers of any organization out there. 
And so you can give if you want to give, but I'm glad the Congress is going to, they're talking about a uh, about a eight or nine billion dollar package, but if Irma hits, that will probably be only a fraction of what's needed. And our great nation has got to come together to help these poor people, but dear me, you think of Puerto Rico, it just went bankrupt. Now they, they say they may be without power for months wow. uh, if this thing hits. And Wendy, it, it breaks your heart to think about what's happening. It does. I could barely sleep. I was up till about two last night. Just I was just thinking about all those little islands and the people on them and the yeah. people that don't have a shelter and those right. those winds. And I was just praying and praying and and, and it's a monster. We just, we haven't seen, uh, they're saying, like you said, this is the biggest storm we've seen in that part of the, the world. Uh, Atlantic, it, yeah. it's terrible. But uh, it's, it's something we just need to be praying about. And uh, it's, it, it breaks your heart. You know, you look at Puerto Rico, they just went bankrupt. They have no money. Yeah. And yet they say the, the power may be out for months. If this thing is, they, they don't have adequate power. It's, and if the, if the uh, utility is, is destroyed by this hurricane, there's nothing they can do. So anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be there to help if we can. And as a nation, we need to help. Well, uh, in other news, the president did what he should have done uh, because Obama put something into place that he himself said was temporary, uh, the so-called dreamers wonderful people, and uh, here is the story about that. That's right, Pat. The program called DACA has protected illegal immigrants who were brought to the U.S. as children from being deported. President Obama started the program in 2012 by executive order, but opponents called it an unconstitutional abuse of executive authority. Many in Congress from both parties say a solution to protect the young people, often called dreamers, should be worked out. But passing a compromise measure isn't likely easy to pass. Well, in the wake of the administration's announcement to rescind DACA, President Obama's former press secretary, Josh Earnest, joined CBN's online political talk show, Faith Nation, today to discuss the decision. You can watch that beginning at 12.30 Eastern Time at CBNNews.com. Well, President Trump heads back to the road to push his new tax plan to the public. He holds an afternoon tax reform event with energy sector workers in Bismarck, North Dakota today, and he's bringing along the state's Democratic Senator Heidi Heitkamp. On Tuesday, the president spoke about his plan to boost the economy here in Washington. We're going to cut taxes. We're going to reduce taxes for people, for individuals, for middle-income families. We're going to reduce taxes for companies, and those companies are going to produce jobs. The goal is to make the tax code as simple as possible, provide tax relief for middle class workers and families, and restore, quote, competitive edge for American businesses. And Pat, the president believes his plan will create millions of new jobs. But it'll be a tremendous boost. Look, our corporations right now are paying the highest taxes in the world. In the world. You see, you have a federal tax. Then you have a state tax, and then many people have a local tax. So you've got three taxes. And uh, the other uh, companies and other nations just have maybe one tax, and those taxes are much lower than ours. So if you look at 35%, then you add on to it, our corporations are at a terrific disadvantage. It's a no-brainer. If you're going to have jobs, you want to have competitive edge, we have to lower the taxes. And uh, the president is right on. And it's nice he's going with Heidi Heitkamp uh, out there in North Dakota. He's got a Democratic senator. Uh, he's building support uh, across the spectrum uh, with Democrats and Republicans to get this thing done. They didn't do a good PR job with the health care, and it failed. This time, I think it's going to win. Maybe they're listening to you. <laughs> Let's hope so. They're, they're listening to somebody, all right. Well, coming up, an amazing interview you don't want to miss. Meet the doctor whose revolutionary program can prevent and reverse the effects of Alzheimer's. Years ago, a European researcher, doctor named Alois Alzheimer,
came up with a diagnosis of a disease that uh, has spread and is now threatening as many as 75 million Americans. More than 5 million Americans currently suffer from that disease called Alzheimer's. And that number is only expected to grow as baby boomers age. It's a devastating disease that robs the sufferer of the capacity to act as a normal human being. It takes away the mind. It takes away the life. And as Laurie Johnson shows, now there may be hope. After 30 years of research, Dr. Dale Bredesen says we now know why we get Alzheimer's and therefore how we can reverse it and even prevent it. He's proven this in trials on people with mild to moderate declines in their memory and ability to think. As he explains in his new book, The End of Alzheimer's, the key is understanding that Alzheimer's can have up to 36 different causes. Just like a roof with 36 holes in it can only work well if all 36 are repaired, all 36 potential causes of Alzheimer's must be addressed for a person's brain to function properly. The causes, he says, include genetics, exposure to metals, toxins, a poor diet, and more. Dr. Bredesen says each of us can see where we are when it comes to all 36 Alzheimer's risk factors by taking a test called a cognoscopy. The results from that test are plugged into a computer algorithm to determine your own individualized treatment based on your own strengths and weaknesses. Dr. Bredesen recommends everyone get a cognoscopy beginning at age 45 to prevent Alzheimer's from taking hold. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thanks, Lori. Uh, the book is called The End of Alzheimer's, and Dr. Dale Bredesen is here with us now. And doctor, this is a, a breakthrough. You researched, according to your book, is there any literature anywhere that says we have a cure for Alzheimer's? No, and we can't call this a cure yet okay. because you really need to look at an autopsy to say, you know, the entire process is gone. Okay. We can't say that yet. What we can say is for the first time, All right. we can reverse the symptoms so we can make people better. And we have now over a thousand people who've been on the protocol. And the key is to look at what's actually driving it. And just as you you wouldn't say, well, you can ignore nine commandments and, and just uh, follow <laughs> one. Yeah. We find the same thing. When you look, this is a complex chronic illness. And if you remember what happened with HIV, it took mm -hmm. three drugs. Yeah. One drug doesn't do very well. All right. well. Alzheimer's is much more complicated than HIV. So we find many different things that have to be addressed. Nobody has dared to come out with a so-called uh, protocol to end it. You're the first one. Am I right in that? That's correct. So in 2014, we published the per first peer-reviewed paper that showed, and this was initially just 10 people, All right. um, and I have to say when we got the first call from the first person who said she was back at work and things were great, I was really surprised and excited because we've been working on this for so many years. We what, see it again and Alzheimer's? again. You know, I, I know we had President Reagan, who was beloved by so many, yeah. had this disease, and he wrote that thing, I'm going into the darkness. And uh, what happens when somebody gets Alzheimer's? This is a great question, Pat. And, you know, in the book, we talk about someone who actually descended and came back. Mm -hmm. And so she wrote about what it actually felt like to be descending into Alzheimer's and then what it felt like to come back and to be well again and to be healthy again. So this is a disease that has a number of different contributors. We, as Lori mentioned, we identified initially 36 things, but these all contribute through the same network to the same ultimate change. Well, People thought, okay, we found amyloid plaques and yippee, we have an answer. Uh, we don't have, we didn't have an answer with that, no, did we? That's exactly right. Here's the surprise, Pat. All right. Amyloid is actually a protective response, which hadn't been appreciated before, to three fundamentally different insults that happen to your brain. Chronic inflammation, 
a reduction of trophic support. Those are nutrients and hormones and factors mm -hmm. and proteins in your brain that support your neurons. And then exposure to toxins. If you're exposed to certain toxins, as Lori had mentioned, from mycotoxins from molds or things like mercury, your brain actually makes this amyloid that we pick up as the disease mm -hmm. as a protective response to that. So it's a very different look than what we originally thought. Right. Let's go uh, against the, 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 those insults. The tropic, for example, well, yes. what exactly is that? So your brain needs dozens and dozens of factors. You have a very complicated computer inside your skull, okay. and it needs not only things like vitamin D and vitamin B12, it needs things like estradiol and progesterone and testosterone, nerve growth factor, which is a protein made by your brain brain-derived neurotrophic factor. There are dozens and dozens of these factors. And what happens is, as you get a little older, you can decrease the production of those so that it changes a fundamental balance. You have a beautiful balance throughout mm -hmm. most of your life in your brain structure. And a change in that balance can ultimately lead to this pulling back that we refer to as Alzheimer's disease. All right, well now, what is it that would be the cause? What, what kind of insult would take place in the brain that would that tend toward Alzheimer? A very good point. There are dozens and dozens of things. So for example, if you have chronic exposure to pathogens such as Lyme disease. That's one thing your body tries to fight the Lyme disease by making the amyloid that you then pick up in the brain as Alzheimer's. If you're exposed, if you have mold in your home, surprisingly, mm -hmm. it turns out that the molds actually make specific toxins called mycotoxins, and there are several of these, mm -hmm. trichothecenes and okra toxin and things like this. You make this, again, to bind up that toxin. You're trying to protect yourself from this, but in so doing, you are also downsizing. So uh, is this mold, if we live in a, in a wet area here down on yes. the ocean, um, mold will tend towards Alzheimer's if you so live in some people. That's a great point. So some people are very good at avoiding it and very good at excreting it. So you, so we're all detoxing ourselves from these various things, and most of us successfully do that. But for people who have some genetic backgrounds, and there's something called HLA DRDQ, it's a genetic marker mm -hmm. that can actually tell you whether you have sensitivity. So we recommend people get this evaluation, we call a cognoscopy, yeah. anyone over 45, get an evaluation to see where do you stand? Do you have, in fact, an environment that's a problem? Do you have insulin resistance, which is one of the very common problems? If you go out and eat a bunch of processed food and a bunch of sugar and things like that, you develop what's called insulin resistance. Your brain no longer responds to the insulin in the way that it should. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the important contributors to Alzheimer's disease. Well, it looks like inflammation is one of the chief causes of all of the pathology that we have. Well, what, you want to talk about that? Absolutely. So inflammation, chronic inflammation, as you know, for heart disease, yeah. it's a problem. And it's also a problem for Alzheimer's. And it leads to what we call type 1 Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So there are these different subtypes that we discovered. And one of them is this inflammatory type. And you know, the Ayurvedic physicians thousands of years yeah. ago knew about this. And they called this pitta. Pitta in dementia. Now, they didn't call it Alzheimer's, of course, but they knew about dementia, and they called that type pitta, which is hot. There was a, a story about a group, <clears throat> I believe it was in uh, Colombia, that, that had a genetic uh, predisposition. To, uh, how extensive is that? That's exactly right. It's a, it's a very <clears throat> uncommon cause worldwide and very uncommon cause in America. So fewer than 5% of people will have this genetically predetermined Alzheimer's. And that particular one that you mentioned is a gene called presenilin-1 or PS1. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it is a cause of familial. But most, 95% of Alzheimer's is so-called sporadic Alzheimer's. It is associated with risk from a gene called ApoE4. Mm -hmm. So good idea to check out your ApoE status. And people used to say, I don't want to know because I yeah. don't, there's nothing you can do. That's wrong. There is a tremendous amount that people can do. 36 factors though in your book, people have got to be 
alert to these, all 36 though, don't they? Well, so the thing is you can now go in and we've trained now 450 <laughs> practitioners from seven different countries and all over the United States so that you can go, including some, uh, some practitioners from Virginia, and you can go and you can find specific causes. You can look and see what your status is, and then you can work with a health coach who will help you to get on the optimal program. And we've developed, a, as Lori said, a, a computer-based program that tells you what are the most important things for you and what is your optimal program. Give us a couple of examples of people who have had, uh, they've, they've sunk into the deep night yeah. of Alzheimer's and they've come back. Uh, uh, it's absolutely striking, Pat, and I have to say, I, I thought I was gonna spend my whole career with transgenic mice. Yeah. <laughs> and so back in 2012, we had our first, first patient come through. Um, and I talk in the, in the book, for example, about uh, one person, uh, Edward, uh, who uh, was unable to remember the people he had lunch with, for example. Um, his uh, had a quantitative neurocognitive testing that showed that he had sunk down to the third percentile for his age. Mm -hmm. He had a PET scan that showed classic Alzheimer's disease. He also had the risk gene, which is the APOE4. So he had mm -hmm. all of those. Uh, and got on the program and, and uh, within six months improved. And finally, he went back for more quantitative testing and he'd gone from the third percentile to the 84th percentile. So doing much better than average. He was literally closing up shop. He's now opened a new office and has three <laughs> offices. That's good. Um, is now uh, four years on the program and doing absolutely splendidly. Well, the program, primarily you're dealing with inflammation you're dealing with the mold, you're dealing with toxins, and you're supplying the nutrients that people need uh, to, to uh, uh, nourish their brain. Is, is exactly that essentially it? The bottom line here is that people do not get this disease for no reason. Uh -huh. And we keep being told it's mysterious. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not mysterious. There are factors that contribute to this, just as there are to heart disease, mm -hmm. no different. And so you look at all these things and you can actually see for each person what is driving the problem. And then what you want to do is attack all those things and you mm -hmm. want to optimize. You change the balance literally between the memory side and the forgetting mm -hmm. side. Peer review, uh, are your associates going along with what you found? I mean, this is a huge breakthrough in my opinion. Thank you very much. So we've had a lot of positive feedback and we've had over 5,000 emails about just our first paper. We've published a few more. There are now over 1,000 people on this. There was an article in the London Times today yeah. about our work. And of course, you can imagine the experts are skeptical. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, as we have more and more people, uh, the skepticism uh, will, will go away. If your work is taken out of the equation, there is nothing. Am I correct? That There's, is correct. There's no alternative no right alternative. now. The drugs do not help very much at all. And our argument is, if you're going to have a drug, fine, but do it on the background of the entire program. So you're talking about the, removing the causes of inflammation, if, mo removing the toxins that are in the system that may be affecting people, giving them the uh, tropic uh, material that they need to build up their brains and uh, that's it. It starts working. It's getting at the root causes and optimizing these many different factors. That's when we begin to see this turn around. And so here's a challenge for all of us. Let's all work together to reduce the global burden of dementia because this is a major problem throughout the world. Uh, if somebody gets your book, do they have the clue? I mean, do they have to uh, get, get uh, one of these uh, tests? Uh, so the book goes through all the different <laughs> things. It goes through all the different tests the scientific background for this, and it's written for everyone. So it goes through all the different tests you can get, where you can get them, what they mean, how to interpret them, and then what is the program. And it even has specific programs that have worked for specific people and people who have talked about their own programs. You're talking about 75 million people at risk of this stuff. I mean, this is, this is huge. This is now the third leading cause of death in the U.S. and the number one cause of death in the U.K., past heart disease and past cancer. In the UK, in the number UK, one? Is, dementia is the number one cause of death in the UK. So but this is a big problem. The, the tragedy that, that comes upon a family when their loved one is suddenly out of it and facing death, 
because most of them die if they've got this, don't oh, they? Yeah, as they say, everyone knows someone who survived cancer. No one knows someone who survived Alzheimer's. So these are the first. Whew. Dr. God bless you. <laughs> I hope you people listen. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is called The End of Alzheimer's. It's available wherever books are sold. Dr. Dale Bradison, it's, it's, well, it's monumental research that he's done. Nobody, in my opinion, has come up with any kind of a solution to Alzheimer's. When people have it, and I've had some dear friends that go into that thing, and it, it is just beyond belief how the, the tragedy in people's homes so um, let's get, let's do what we can. Doctor, thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. God Thanks for having you. me on. All right. Dr. Dale Bradison, ladies and gentlemen. The book, again, is called The End of Alzheimer's. This is, is not an easy read, I might add. To say this is a fun book would be why. <laughs> I've got to say, it is very complex. And this 36 step is complex, but so is Alzheimer's. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Wendy. Wow, fascinating. Thanks, Pat. Well, in our Protect Your Brain series, you'll find more tips for warding off Alzheimer's. This DVD can be yours free of charge. Just call the number on your screen or you can log on to CBN.com to request your free DVD. Well, up next, your questions, honest answers. Lisa says, my son is 10 years old and he saw something on the internet about Jesus coming on the 23rd of September, 2017. It's gotten to the point where he's scared of any loud noises like fireworks. We'll have that and more, stay tuned. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. And welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time for your questions and some honest answers from Pat Robertson. We're going to start with this question from Lisa. She says, Pat, my son is 10 and he saw something on the Internet about Jesus coming on the 23rd of September 2017, which is a few days away, and has gotten to the point where he's scared of any loud noises like fireworks, etc., I'm wondering if you could maybe calm him down, maybe pray for him on TV or something. Well, I, I'll say this to him right now. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, not the angels in heaven, not the sun. In other words, Jesus himself said, I don't know when it's going to be for me. And only the Father has it in his power. So for somebody that says it's going to be the 23rd of, of, of September, he's lying through his teeth. And do not believe him. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And when the Lord comes, he's going to come with a shout of command. The angels will, will rise in chorus. The dead in Christ shall rise. It will be a, a, a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise. And it's going to be a glorious thing. You don't have to be scared of it. But in the meantime, Nobody knows. And for somebody to say it's the 23rd, he is lying. Okay. Well, he's 10, he's probably thinking, don't come back yet. That's <laughs> <You know. laughs> All that? right. Elizabeth writes, what does it mean when a church includes the word reformed in its title? Well, I think it has to do with the Reformation. Uh, uh, the, the Reformed Church uh, uh, was that which came out of the Reformation tradition. And it, it, it is not uh, sacerdotal. It doesn't have the uh, uh, trappings of the uh, more sacerdotal churches that have all the ceremonies and so forth. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is reformed primarily dealing with the Bible. They believe the Bible is foundational in the, in the preaching. So it's, they're stripped down uh, churches. You see the pulpit at the center. There are a lot of things like this, but that's what essentially they're talking about. It's, it's out of the Reformation. Okay. Here's one from Amanda. She says, I've always believed in what comes around goes around. So I try to be a good person, but it always seems like my family and I always get the bad end of the stick. Yet I know quite a few people who are terrible. They lie, steal, and much more. And it seems like they are always on top and have no problems. So does the devil control karma? Because it honestly feels like it. <laughs> well, karma, by the way, is the Hindu concept of a wheel of fate that goes round and round and round. And, <laughs> you know, you have good karma and bad karma. That's baloney. Uh, I, that is not a biblical concept whatsoever. Um, well, the Bible does say you reap what you sow. And so 
uh, if you're doing a certain thing, if you're hurting people, the chances are it's going to come back and, and hurt you. But, um, you know, the Bible, you read the Psalms, and the psalmist is looking, you know, how come these evil people get away with so much? Their children are healthy. They're fat and happy. They got lots of money. And everything seems to be going well for them. Well, the Bible says, until I looked at the last day and I saw their end, mm -hmm. they're on a slippery slope, and the end of those people is hell itself. So don't you be worried about what's happening to somebody else. You do what's right for you, and God will look after you. All right? Amen. Good word. All right, Serena says, is it okay to have pictures, figurines of Jesus in your home as long as you're not praying to them? Hmm. Well, we're not supposed to worship idols, but I, I, I just think, you know, a picture of Jesus, I mean, yeah. what's the big deal? My grandmother had one in her kitchen that well, she always sure. had there. Yeah. Uh, but just keep in mind, you, you don't pray to that picture. You don't pray to some angel. You don't pray to saint so whatever. And when you begin to do that, then you're into idolatry as far as a picture. But, you know, we're not supposed to have graven images. And, you know, that's one of the commandments. But uh, I, I just don't think it's any problem. I don't believe it would if we took away all the pictures, you'd, you'd demolish most of the great art of the Renaissance. <laughs> Of course, yeah. nobody knows exactly what Jesus looked like, but there, yeah. there's a well, lot of different depictions of him. Well, you, you read in Isaiah what it was. He was so, his visage was so marred, he didn't even look human. Wow. They beat him up so badly, so he wasn't a pretty thing. He had no form or comeliness that we would desire him. Right. But um, nevertheless, I say you'd have to destroy all of the art of the Renaissance, and there's some really, really beautiful mm -hmm. pictures of the holy family of Jesus and so forth, um, as long as you don't worship them. It, it, uh, at the same time, mm. uh, you know, there are statues in these churches where the, the people have literally rubbed the, the toes almost off because they're rubbing them and asking for blessing. No way. That's idolatry. All right. Well, those were some, definitely some good, honest answers and some great questions, so we appreciate that. Well, Stella had everything you always wanted to know about heaven. Pastor and Fox News contributor Robert Jeffress answers the most frequently asked questions about a place called heaven, and he joins us live later on today's show. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The U.S. Ambassador to Israel says President Trump will move the American Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Ambassador David Friedman told the Jerusalem Post the move will come at the right time, describing it as not a question of if, but when. He said, it's something we think about all the time. Friedman also described the relationship between President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as, quote, phenomenal. Well, the political divisions between Americans are growing wider and they aren't likely to change. A new poll from the Wall Street Journal and NBC News shows people who call themselves Republicans and Democrats see things very differently on a wide variety of subjects, from economics to cultural issues and attitudes. Democrats, for instance, are twice as likely to say they never go to church as Republicans. The two groups have different views on diversity, gun rights, immigration, and more. The poll also found those differences didn't start with President Trump. They've been widening for decades. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Welcome back. You are watching the 700 Club. Man, we've got a bunch of stuff today. We've gone from Alzheimer's to heaven. And <laughs> heaven, that's where we want to go there. Paul said, I'll do anything I could that I may attain the resurrection of the just. And we all want to know what it's going to be like. Well, take a look. You might recognize Dr. Robert Jeffers as a Fox News contributor. He also pastors a 13,000-member church in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Jeffers says throughout his frequent travels around the world, he thinks about one trip that will last for eternity. In his book, A Place Called Heaven, 
He shares why it's important for all of us to focus on heaven and how thinking about the next life can make us more effective in this one. Well, it's a fascinating book. It's called, Whoa, A Place Called Heaven. Dr. Robert Jeffries has written it, and he's with us right now. Robert, it's good to have you with us. God bless you. Thank you, Pat, for having me. All right, look, where's heaven? Well, How about that? <clears throat> that's a great question, <laughs> and a lot of people are really mixed up about that, Pat, right. because one of the questions I answer is, do we immediately go to heaven when we die? Yeah. The short answer is we go immediately into the presence of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So we're conscious, we're awake, we know what's yeah. happening, but that's not our ultimate destination. Right. Ultimately, we're going to spend eternity right here on this recreated earth, just as God intended it to be. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, down to earth, and this is where we're going to be instead of floating around up there in some hey, foreign I planet. I kind of like that. With the, yes. We talk so much about the rapture, get people getting caught up out of here, but really, what you're saying is that heaven will be a recreated earth. That's right. And that's what uh, John said in Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and, and a new, new earth. earth. And you know, that's the interesting thing, Pat. When we die, yeah. we don't become somebody else in heaven. It is we who die. We are the ones who go to heaven. We retain our names. We retain our personalities. I think even some of the same gifts that we have right now are going to extend throughout eternity so that we have something to do in the new heaven and well, earth. Let's talk about what, what are we going to do? I mean, people think, well, I'm going to sit around on a cloud playing a harp all the day. That's not, that's not it at all. Huh? Or let's face it, Pat. Some people think heaven is going to be one long, unending church service, and that sounds more like <laughs> hell to people than heaven. <laughs> that's much fun as it looks. Leg cramp. <laughs> and look, we've got to be honest. We are going to worship in heaven, but we're going to do more than worship. We're going to work in heaven and on this new earth. God made us to be workers. He's, he created us to work. It's not a curse. It's a gift from God. We're going to work on the new earth. And I wouldn't be surprised, Pat, if our work in the new heaven and new earth doesn't resemble what we do right now. Well, you know, I mean, you're a great entrepreneur. That's right. You're a tremendous broadcaster. I don't think God just limited those gifts for right now. You may be hosting the heavenly edition of the 700 Club. Who knows? Can you imagine? <laughs> for all eternity. For all eternity. Well, you, you know, that, that uh, Paul said we've judged the angels. So do you think there's going to be a time, a big tribunal, where we'll be, where the saints of God will be doing that? I think for some people, there will be judgments. I think for some people, we're going to be uh, uh, ruling and reigning with Christ, 2 mm -hmm. Timothy 2. I think we'll be creating new things in heaven. I think there's all kind of responsibilities that will be given to us, by the way, based on our faithfulness to Christ mm -hmm. in this life. And this is one of the things I talk about in a place called heaven. As brief as our life is here on earth compared to eternity, mm -hmm. what we do in these few short years has eternal consequences. What we do on earth reverberates in the halls of heaven forever. People have asked me about, uh, you know, the idea of, uh, of you know, a baby. He he's, dies when he's a year old, and the thought would be that he's matured up to about 30 or something, and people in their 80s or 90s come back to 30. What, what age do you think would, is there, for spirits, it really doesn't matter, huh? It's pure conjecture yeah. of what our age is going to be. Some people say 30 because that's when Christ began his yeah. ministry. It's just conjecture, but the good news is we are who we were here on earth. Did you know, Pat, for example, we're going to retain our names in heaven. Yeah. I mean, Moses and Elijah, they had been dead for hundreds of years, but when they came back with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were Moses and Elijah. They weren't somebody else. So we retain our names. We're going to have bodies, by the way. People ask, do we know one another in heaven? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, our bodies are going to be like Jesus Christ in his resurrection body. His disciples knew him. Not only that, Jesus ate in his new resurrection yes, body. Did. So the best news for a lot of people is we're going to eat in heaven. <laughs> That's uh, 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 absolutely but, but always in moderation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, what do you think about people? Uh, why are there so many misconceptions about heaven? I mean, do, what happens when we die, for example? When do we go to heaven? 
Well, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, 8, immediately we go to be with the Lord. There's no such thing in the Bible, Pat, as soul sleep. Yeah. Or that, that is a man-made concept. We go immediately to be with the Lord. And I think the misconceptions come about because many people and even many Christians mm -hmm. get their ideas about heaven from Hollywood. Yeah. The movies or TV or some of these fanciful books that have been written about heaven. I base my book, A Place Called Heaven, on what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible has a lot to say about heaven. It sure does. And you know, one of the questions Pat people have is, well, why even talk about heaven? With all that's going on in the world, hurricanes, mm -hmm. or a conflict with North Korea, shouldn't we be thinking about this world instead of the next world? And yet, isn't this a perfect time to be talking about heaven? Best of all. To remind us that this world is not all that there is. God has something better for us. What do you think uh, we're going to be, uh, well, you said, uh, what do you think we're going to be doing? Uh, Jesus talked about a re reward. He said they will yes. not lose their reward. He'll be get the reward of a prophet and so forth. Yes. Well, what, what kind of rewards do you think there are? That is a great question. And I spend a whole chapter talking about, will heaven be the same for everybody? A lot mm -hmm. of people think heaven is going to be kind of a sanctified socialism where we all get the same size house and the same plot <laughs> yeah. of land and so forth. No, the Bible says there are degrees of heaven yeah. based on our faithfulness to Christ in this life. And while our good works have absolutely nothing to do with securing our place in heaven, mm -hmm. good works make a lot of difference after we're uh, saved. Uh, and they determine the kind of heaven we experience. I think those rewards, the Bible refers to them as crowns, but I think they refer to special privileges. For example, mm -hmm. the Bible talks about special access to the tree of life, special positions, special praise we'll hear from God. Mm -hmm. Well done, good yeah. and faithful servant. Whatever these rewards are, Paul said they are worth sacrificing for. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, when people do small things here on earth, they reverberate in heaven forever. Giving the uh, Operation Blessing, for example, that is something we do right here on earth, but there are rewards we receive in heaven for doing these things. You know, the Apostle Paul said we'll all stand before the beam of the judgment yes. seat of Christ to receive the things we've done in our body. Talk about that. Yeah, <clears throat> that's one of the misconceptions people have, that if we're a Christian, we never have to face the judgment of God. <clears throat> it's true we never face God's condemnation. Our sins have been forgiven. Yeah. But we will experience God's evaluation mm -hmm. of our life. And what you talk about, the judgment seat of Christ, is talking about that. We, Paul was talking to Christians, we must all appear before that judgment seat of Christ. And 1 Corinthians 3 says, if our works are seen to be wood, hay, and stubble, yeah. we will suffer loss. Pat, there's going to be real measurable loss as we see what could have been ours had we not been, if, if we had been more faithful. The good news is to our audience is there's still time right now to make a change in your life. If you're not living for Christ as a Christian, you can make a change that really will make an eternal difference in that place called heaven. Brother, you, you hit the nail right on the head. God bless you. A place called heaven. Dr. Robert Jeffrey, this is a sound book, ladies and gentlemen. You really ought to get a copy of it. Where, where do they get these things? The book's available in all Christian bookstores and all secular bookstores or at Amazon.com. Amazon? Okay. And it's a great encouragement, by the way, to those who may be facing heaven soon sure. as well. Well, God bless you. It's a wonderful analysis, and I appreciate your being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pat. God bless you. Well, we can also hear uh, more from Dr. Jeffries today in an exclusive interview on our Facebook page, so be sure to check that out. Here's Wendy. All right, great interview. Well, coming up, we'll be praying for you and your needs, so stay with us. Jackie Dawson had already endured 20 hours of labor when her doctor ordered an emergency C-section. But the pain meds had not kicked in, and Jackie could feel every aspect of the surgery. So while she cried out for mercy, her husband stormed heaven with prayer. July 6, 2016 was an exciting day for Jackie and Gabriel Wilford. That afternoon, Jackie went into labor with their first child. I prayed my whole life, you know, I want a son, I want someone that I can raise up to be a servant for you, God. 
Jackie had been in labor 20 hours when they learned the baby developed an infection. With mother and child in danger, her doctor ordered an emergency C-section. I don't think it set in. The reality of a C-section and the complications, they could both die if they don't do this procedure. So when it really hit me is when I actually saw her on the table. That's when it actually, I'm like, okay, this is, this is something real. This is a serious thing. They started the surgery, but the pain blockers hadn't taken effect. It was the most painful thing I've ever went through. And so I, I did, I, I felt like I was dying. It was, it was horrible. I can feel every single thing. I could feel the, the doctor's hands press on my stomach and then the, it was just really painful. <laughs> the doctor delivered a healthy baby boy, but by then, Jackie had gone into shock. I kept sh uncontrollably shaking and I could, I had to keep my hands to my like body because I felt like my body was just shutting down. I couldn't, I couldn't speak at one point. I knew it was serious, but I didn't want to let my mind start to, to think about it. And then, you know, if I'm panicking, well then there's no way that I can be there for my kid or my wife. Gabriel texted family in the waiting area to pray for Jackie. I remember the doctor saying, okay, well, we're gonna put you to sleep right now. And then at that time I was like praying like, Lord, please, 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 like help me, help my son, and make sure we come out healthy. The doctor stabilized Jackie and moved her to a recovery room. Gabriel thought the danger was past. It was, it was a sigh of relief. I was like, okay, Jackie's in the recovery room. She's holding the baby. She's a little woozy, but that's okay. It all went south when the doctor walked over to her and, you know, he pulled up her, the, the blankets that were on her. There was uh, so much blood that just came out. It just came pouring out. I was really scared. I was scared of what I saw. I saw in his eyes a little bit of fear and I did, I became fearful. Jackie passed out and the doctor called a code blue. Gabriel and baby Dawson were rushed from the room as the code blue team went to work. I just wanted somebody to come and grab me <laughs> and tell me it's gonna be okay. I was preparing myself for the worst. I did not want to be a single dad. Jackie's so fun and she's my best friend. So it'd be like losing, you know, a part of me and things like that. Alone in the hall, Gabriel cried out to God. I opened my heart to him and I told him if he could, uh, if he could save Jackie, if he could hear this prayer of mine, he had spoke to me right away. Gabriel says God assured him that he was in control and that Jackie would be fine. I cried out to him and he was right there. You know, before I even cried out to him, he was, he was right there, I just didn't see it. You know, God had taken my burden, taken those woes, and no matter what happened, I knew, hey, it's gonna be okay. You don't have to worry about anything at all. A few minutes later, they told Gabriel his wife had pulled through and was resting. He recalls the relief as he walked into her room. I just started joking around with her, how we, you know, I was like, you know, you almost died on me. I remember thinking all those things, you know, we could joke so much. Um, I said, she's my best friend. Over the next couple of days, Gabriel opened up in a Facebook post about his love for Jackie and the miraculous answer to prayer. I couldn't let her know how scared I was. I wanted to say I love you and tell her everything's gonna be okay. I watched helplessly as they tried to save my wife. I wanted to cry out to God and ask him why. God spoke to me. Gabriel, my son, I love you more than you can imagine. It's okay to call on me. I will always love you. Dawson was given a round of antibiotics to clear up his infection. A few days later, he and Jackie were released from the hospital. Both Jackie and Gabriel believe that prayer saved her life that day. I really believe that God heard our prayers, that maybe it was time for me to go. Maybe, maybe my time here on earth was done, like there was no more for me, and God heard someone's voice saying that. I have a purpose, like I have a reason to be here. God answered prayers because I, I do, I, I really thought I was dying. A lot of people, I don't, I don't think they, they understand the power of prayer. It's your one connection to God that he actually hears your voice, the, the uh, maker of the world, you know, they can actually hear you. Prayer 
is power. No matter in what circumstance, no matter how amazing your circumstances are, it is powerful. It is the most powerful tool we have. And when we finally recognize how powerful it is, we can move mountains. What a story. I love what she just said. Prayer is the most powerful tool we have. In James, it says, the prayers of the righteous availeth much, not little. If you're in need today, if you're right now before your TV, I don't believe it's a coincidence. If you need God to touch you, if you need a miracle, we're going to pray for that right now. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we just thank you right now that you are the God of the impossible. There is nothing too hard for you. There's someone right now, you've been uh, experiencing severe back pain in the left side of your back. God's touching you right now. You're being healed. Someone with chronic sinus infection that just won't go away. You're being healed today right now. There's a lady and you're crying and you're in deep grief, a deep uh, experiencing a, some great loss. God is bringing you comfort. You are, this season will pass and your joy is going to be restored. Father, we thank you right now for touching everyone who needs a healing in their body. Lord, if they just reach out right now and put their hands on the place that it hurts, God, you are going to give them what they need in Jesus' name. Lord, also protect everyone in Irma's path, in Hurricane Irma's path, Lord. Protect your people in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we leave you today with this Power Minute from Psalm 1611. In your presence is the fullness of joy at your right hand or pleasures forevermore. From all of us here, we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow you can also find out what is Antifa.